In my last video, I gave a quick demonstration of creating Vera compatible tiles and tile maps using a set of custom tools that I created for Commander X16 development. In that video, I said I'd make a follow up video to show how the same tools can be used to implement collisions in a Commander X16 game. It's been a while, but I finally found the time to make that video, so here we go! I have an example game that I've been writing in order to test out these tools as I develop them, although the game is starting to take on a life of its own. It's a top-down airship-themed RPG that I've tentatively named Take to the Skies. This game will serve as the example of my particular solution for collision detection. The game uses two tile layers, both set to 16x16 16 16 8 bits per pixel tiles. So just like the demo in my last video, my whole game uses easy mode when it comes to making the graphics, where I have a full 256 colors at my disposal without ever having to worry about palette offsets. It cost me quite a bit of VRAM, but the Vera has VRAM to spare, and that's on top of the Commander X16's available memory. I also want my game to have a large open world feel to it. This means large maps so the player can walk a long distance before triggering a change of the map. Because my tile data alone takes up an entire half of the available VRAM, the largest map I can make is 128 by 64 tiles. If I go one step larger to 128 by 128, I run out of VRAM to store the tile map, let alone any other graphic resources I need, such as player sprites. Still, 128 by 64 is plenty big when using 16 by 16 tiles. In any case, I'll be using large enough maps that specifying collisions manually will be a huge task. In order to know when my player sprite collides with an object, I'm going to need some data for my game code to interpret. This gives me two general options. I can interpret collision information from the graphics tiles and tile maps directly, or I can create a specific collision map stored separately. Basically, can I reuse the data that is already in VRAM, or am I going to need to generate and store additional data in main memory? Let's explore these options, starting with reusing the existing tiles. The easiest approach would be to define entire tiles as collidable. This means that each 16x16 16 16 square on the screen will either be a place the player can go, or a place the player is never allowed. This is how games like Attack of the Petsky Robots work, where the player never spans tiles, but rather jumps directly from tile to tile. If I went this route, I'd probably just decide that all tiles above or below a certain index are collidable, and the player sprite will stop on the square next to it. While this approach works well on a game designed for the Commodore Pet, which has no graphic modes and no scroll offsets, I don't think this gameplay would fit my game. It simply makes the movement too blocky and isn't what you'd expect from a game on a more advanced system like the Commander X16. I want my movement to be pixel by pixel, so I want my collisions to work that way as well. The next way I could reuse the graphics tiles would be to define different colors as collidable. That way, my collision detection code could look up the tiles the player sprite is currently on and interpret the existing color data as collision data. This would require a lot of setting and resetting the Vera data cursor. Also, a single 16x16 16 16 8 bits per pixel tile is 256 bytes, so this solution would require a fair amount of copying from VRAM in order to do the calculations. On top of that, the purpose behind having 8 bits per pixel color tiles is so that I can utilize the full palette for shading and highlighting. Inevitably, some shade or highlight color for one tile is going to need to be defined as collidable for another, which breaks the whole plan. I'd have to be far too careful with my color usage for this solution to be appealing. Now let's look at using a second set of collision-specific data that corresponds with the graphic tiles. With this solution, I'd have an area of main memory dedicated to custom collision tiles. These tiles would be 16x16, 16 16, just like the graphics tiles, but they only need a single bit of information per pixel. So even though I'm arguably duplicating the data in memory, this version of it is one-eighth the size per tile. Plus, many of the graphics tiles will be able to share the same collision tile. They don't have to map one-to-one. -one. These tiles would still have to have a tile map that corresponds to the graphical tile map that is loaded into VRAM. Just like how the Vera tile node works, this map would point to the collision tile that is used on that particular square of the map. Although the Vera uses two bytes per tile for its tile maps, I don't need the palette offset, the flip bits, nor the upper two bits of the tile index. My collision tile map only needs to be one byte per tile, which means the collision tile map in main memory will be half the size of the graphical tile map in VRAM. 
In addition, I only need a single collision tile map, whereas I need two separate graphical tile maps for my two layers in the Vera. So although this solution requires more memory, it doesn't add up to be anywhere close to how much memory we use in VRAM. This minimal extra memory usage is a good trade-off in order to get pixel-level collisions and no color restrictions on my tiles. For my game, this is definitely the way to go. I now have a plan, and even have data formats to find for both the collision tiles and collision maps. What I'm missing is a way to create that data in the first place, and a method for interpreting the data in my code. First, let's start with generating the collision tiles themselves. If you watched my video about creating graphical tiles and maps, then you'll remember that I created a custom GIMP output plugin that generates Vera-compatible tile sets. Because the format of my collision tiles is the same as a 1-bit per pixel graphical tile, I can use the same plugin to create collision tiles. Here you see my tile set in the GIMP. It is just a color indexed image with only two colors in the color map, black and red. I use red to represent the collidable pixels and black for free space. These particular tiles were just created as needed while I was making my maps, but you could certainly spend a little more time and forethought to create a more logical set. Notice that since I am not allowing my collision tile maps to use H-flip or V-flip, I need to include flipped tiles separately. Even so, I still managed to fit all the collision data for my 256 different graphical tiles into 64 collision tiles. So the number of collision tiles is a quarter of the number of my graphical tiles, and the size of each collision tile is an eighth of the size of the graphical counterparts. Again, you can see how this is actually minimal RAM usage compared to my graphics. Using my output plugin, I can export a binary file using 1 bit per pixel mode, which I've conveniently labeled as useful for collisions. If you recall from my previous video, this export can also be scripted from a makefile, but we'll cover that later. For now, we are simply going to generate the tile data, tiled tile set file, and a bitmap for that tile set file. Now we need to focus on generating the collision maps. Let's create a new map to go over the process that needs to be done in order to generate a simple collision map. I have several buildings in my game that the player can enter, but I haven't defined all of them yet. I might as well create the next one while I'm making this video. The first thing I need to do is to create a new map. This building is small, so I only need a 32 by 32 tile map. I need to make sure that my tiles are set to 16 by 16 pixels, just like in my game code. Before I start drawing my map, I need to import my tile sets into the project. This is both the collision tile set and the graphical tiles. My buildings are too small to really benefit from using the terrain set features in Tiled. So let's just draw our interior manually. First, I draw a floor using my hardwood tiles. When I select two at once, Tiled knows to place them one after the other. I also need to rename my layers so that I can refer to them later when I'm using my command line tool. I like the names Terrain and Things for my layers 0 and 1, respectively. Next, I can draw the back wall and the side walls. I'll use the H-flip bit on one of the side walls, since they share a tile in VRAM. Next, I'll move up a layer and draw the front wall and the front door. This wall should be rendered in front of the player sprite and not behind it. Finally, I'm going to spend a little time drawing furniture. I've decided that for the most part, the collisions are going to prevent the player from walking behind furniture. This means that the furniture will be placed on the same layer as the floor. In this way, the player will be able to walk in front of the furniture, but will stop short of walking on furniture. Now that I have a map for my new building, I need to add the collision tiles. I create a new layer in Tiled and call it Collision. I then select my collision tile set that I generated earlier and start placing collision tiles in the collision layer. I like to lower the opacity of this layer so I can see my map through it, but this has no effect on the output we are going to create. It's just visually nice. You may notice that I'm using the same collision tiles again and again, and often using the same tile for different objects in the room. This work is tedious, and I'll show you a better way shortly. Meanwhile, it's time to generate our map. I save my map file and give it a name that makes sense in the context of my game. My tool to convert maps from tiled into Vera compatible maps is a command line tool, so I need to open a terminal in the directory where my tiled files are. Unlike the collision tile data, the collision map data is different from that which the Vera uses. The map data doesn't need the second byte, so I created the command line flag dash C 
to exclude it. When this flag is used, only the tiles index is written out and the second byte is omitted. This also means that any flip bits in the tiled map file are ignored. Other than this flag, I simply need to specify the input file, the layer, and the output file. Once this tool runs, we have the binary that can be loaded into the Commander X16's main memory. Using this along with the collision tile binary from the GIMP plugin, the game now has all the data it needs to detect collisions. Although I now have a way to visually draw my collisions on top of my map, this isn't a particularly good process. By separating the collision maps and tiles from the graphical maps and tiles, I've created a process where I need to manually define the tiles of my maps twice. On smaller maps, this isn't so bad, but on larger overworld maps, this becomes unacceptable. Just look at how big the overworld is for my starting level. Fortunately, Tiled has a ready-made solution. When I first sat down to create my map tools, I originally planned on writing my own tile mapping application instead of using what's already available. However, there were two features in Tiled that were simply too useful for me to pass on and too complicated to re-implement. Those features are terrain sets and auto mapping. I covered terrain sets briefly in my previous video, so I won't cover that here, but I will show how Tiled's auto mapping feature can be used to easily generate collision maps. Auto mapping is basically a search and replace system for tiles. You create a rule where a tile or pattern of tiles is searched for in one layer, and if found, a different pattern of tiles can be substituted or even added to other layers. For my purposes, I can configure a collision tile to be associated with every graphical tile. That way, the auto mapper will place the correct collision tile into the collision layer every time I place a tile on my map. I never have to manually place the collision tiles. Auto mapping in Tiled works by defining a rules.txt file. This file is just a list of TMX files, which is the extension Tiled uses for its maps. This is the same type of file that all maps in Tiled use, but these maps used as rules are interpreted differently. I'll leave a link or two in the description to videos that better explain Tiled's auto mapping, because it can get a little complicated and I don't have time to explain everything here. My collision rules are simple. If the auto mapper sees a certain tile in one of the layers, it places the corresponding collision tile into the collision layer. That's really it. Once set up, you can choose to run the auto mapper manually or have it automatically running in the background as you create your maps. Now if I delete my collision layer, I can simply run the auto mapper and it regenerates it perfectly without me having to place the tiles. You may notice that I sometimes used the wrong tile when I manually added the collisions and that the auto mapper corrected them. Maintaining consistency is another great reason to use auto mapping. If I place new furniture tiles in my map, you can see how the auto mapper runs in the background adding the collision tiles. Doing a one-time setup for collision tiles certainly makes the task of creating maps much, much easier. With auto mapping and terrain sets, creating my game world is a lot less daunting. Sometimes, however, I don't want the collision tiles to follow the normal rules. For example, the trees on my overworld map are collidable and should stop the player's movement. That said, I am partial to secret paths hidden in the trees. This could be done easily by manually modifying collision tiles after auto mapping, but then I have to remember to do that every time I happen to regenerate my collision layer. It's not a good solution. Luckily, I can set up a more forward thinking solution with the auto mapper. The order of my map files in the rules.txt file matter. They need to be listed in the order you want them to run. So when you run the auto mapper, it is actually processing the rules one at a time. Importantly, this means that earlier changes made by the auto mapper can be overridden. I've set up a tile layer in my overworld map called Collision Override. In this layer, I can manually place collision tiles. I also have a rule map listed in my rules file that looks at this layer and places any collision tile it finds there directly into the collision layer. So now, as I'm editing, I can arbitrarily decide what collision tile is used where, even if it doesn't match the official collision tile for the graphical tile where it is placed. In other words, I can hide paths in the trees, put invisible walls anywhere I want, and of course, hide secret rooms behind waterfalls. It also means that my collision layer is still 100% generated, and I don't have to worry about losing custom collisions when I manually run the auto mapper. With tiles and maps created, and the process of doing so simplified, it's time to look at what we do with the data. The process I've come up with is fairly straightforward. On every V-Sync interrupt, the player's new position on the map is determined from joystick input. 
and the correct collision tiles are looked up using the collision tile map in RAM. I then check those tiles to see if the player is allowed to enter that space. If not, the joystick data is ignored. Let's run through an example. Here we see the player sprite overlaid on top of the tile map. In the typical case, the sprite will span four individual tiles. This is because both the sprite and the tiles in the map are 16 by 16 pixels. Because the player is represented with a sprite, it does not have to be aligned to the same grid as the background tiles. Using the collision tiles and the collision tile map we defined earlier, we can overlay the collision tiles on top of the graphic tiles. The player tile also has its own hard-coded collision tile that follows it around and is not aligned to the grid. Let's remove the graphics so we can look just at the sprite's collision tile and the map's collision tiles. The first thing the collision detection code will need to do is to create a composite tile from the four possible collision tiles that the player sprite is positioned over. The remaining job of the code will be to overlay the player's collision tile and see if any of the pixels overlap. Remember that our collision tiles are stored one bit per pixel. Each pixel either collides or it doesn't. At this point, we've simplified the job to comparing two tiles row by row. Because each row is 16 bits and we're only using an 8-bit processor, we're going to have to take two steps to compare each row. First, we'll compare the left half of the row, and then we'll compare the right. Each comparison itself is easy. We just load up one byte from the player's collision tile and one byte from the composite collision tile and AND them together. If the result is zero, we know that no collision has occurred. If the result is non-zero, we know we have a collision. You can see that in this example, the last row contains a collision. The player would be unable to move into this space. At this point, I have all the ingredients needed for a what you see is what you get graphics editor with built-in collision generation and real-time feedback. I can edit my maps easily and immediately run the game and see the results. All that's needed now is to tie the pieces together. To do that, I utilize the age-old technology of a makefile. First, I need to add my new resources to my game. I use a naming convention to try to keep things organized, so on this map, every resource file begins with a PI. The building I created is a sub-map off the level's overworld map, so it shares tiles with all the other maps for this level and won't need to reload them. I will have both a layer 0 and a layer 1 map to load, however. In addition to the graphics, I also need to load the collision map, so I need to give that resource a file name as well. I've already written the code that loads these resources into my game and handles all other map initialization. It's not really worth going over in this video, because your game will likely have different preferences for when to load and initialize which resources. If you want to see a simple example of loading graphics resources, see my previous video linked in the description. For simplicity, I've also added the code that switches to the new map when the player enters the building. Now it's time to take a look at the makefile itself. In my game code, each level is developed in a subdirectory that has its own makefile and is called recursively from the main makefile. Your project may work differently, but the sub makefile is what I'll be dealing with in this video. I need to add the three resources I just defined to the list of resources in the makefile. This list defines the files that the makefile is responsible for creating and updating. You can see that I add my level prefix automatically, so I can change it easily if I have to. Once those resources are in the list, I need to define the individual make targets that build each of them. Because all three of these resources are tile maps, all three make targets will use the TMX to Vera tool to extract the data from my TMX file and put it into the correct format. I have a snippet defined to make this easier. The layer maps are generated exactly the same as in my previous video, but the collision maps need to use the dash C flag in order to indicate that this is a collision map. With these make targets in place, my level make file knows to build the resources, and my main make file is already set up to automatically copy them to the same directory as my game binary. I should be able to run my game and play my new map, collisions and all. Thank you for watching. You can find the links to my previous video and my development tools in the description below.